I'd like to talk about um, my, my time in Nepal and particularly how it, how it formed me, how it changed me or, or affected me. And also a little bit the idea of, uh, of what, is, what is a missionary? What does it mean uh, in, in these days to, to be a missionary? And I'll also tell you a little bit about a couple of my heroes among the Jesuits who were missionaries, Canadian Jesuits who went to that part of the world, India and Nepal, many years ago. One of them is a, a man named Father Murray Abraham, who, he was in India, in the Darjeeling area, for over 60 years, and he died recently at the age of 87. He worked in schools and a social agricultural center, and the, one of the mottos of, of the center was helping the poor help themselves. So when I was a, a novice with the Jesuits, and uh, yeah, so I'm a Jesuit, by the way. <laughs> Scholastic, I'm in, in training. And um, so when I was a novice, I wrote an email to Father Abraham in India asking, about work, asking him about working with the poor and vow of poverty and stuff like that. And he wrote me a nice reply. He, he wrote to me, he quoted an early Jesuit named uh, Juan Polanco who said that friendship with the poor makes us friends with the eternal king. And Father Abraham talked about the early Jesuits at the Council of Trent. There were a couple of Jesuits, uh, I think it was in the 1550s when the Council of Trent was going on and these Jesuits were like theological advisors for the Council. And Father Ignatius, St. Ignatius, who was the general of the Jesuits at the time, he advised them in the evenings to go and be in the hospitals with the poor. So I guess to have a, some balance uh, with their important work in the council and to spend time with the poor. And one thing also that Father Abraham told me was that being with the poor will change us more than it changes them. So that I thought was interesting coming from a missionary who you, you, know, you might think is going there to, to give or to help others saying you know, that he's more changed or, or more benefited. So um, as far as why I was in Nepal or what I was doing there, I guess I have uh, a few kind of answers or explanations for, for what I was doing there or why I was there. One was that I had discerned that I wanted to go there. I, you know, I had a desire to do that kind of work. Um, in that part of the world or to work with Jesuit refugee service. And I discerned that along with my Jesuit provincial who is also the, uh, the formation director at the time. So he, he missioned me to go there. Another reason I was there was to do a, a certain kind of work. I you know, did a number of things there in, in a number of capacities, but the main job I had, I was a, a resource teacher with uh, Caritas. So I was working with Jesuit Refugee Service, but also with Caritas. And I was a resource teacher. Um, Caritas runs, still does, run the education programs in the refugee camps there. So it's refugees from Bhutan who are in Nepal. And uh, Caritas does the education programs. And my job, uh, along with a, a partner, another resource teacher, was to to help out the spoken English programs. So the adults in the, adults in the camps, uh, a number of them were, were learning English through these spoken English centers. Learning English because uh, many of them were going to be moving to the United States and Canada and English speaking countries. So what I did in this job, along with uh, my partner and the, the other people from the office, um, well, one thing we, we could do was we could supply materials to them in the camps because we had, in the town and the office we had access to a computer which they didn't there so we could you know, look things up and print things off and distribute things that might be helpful for their lessons. Another thing I did, they were interested, the, uh, the people studying English there were interested in learning what they called American English because many of them were moving to America. And I was the closest thing there to an American. <laughs> so, so they were interested in, in hearing, hearing my accent, listening to me talk, and interested in learning kind of American vocabulary as opposed to maybe a, more of a Nepali, Indian kind of English. So, so their, their English was slightly different and they were interested in learning the American. Like for example, what, what we call a wallet 
they would call a purse, and uh, what we call ketchup, they would call tomato sauce. So, uh, so they're interested in you know learning the American terms. Another thing I would do, I would do in this capacity as resource teacher is at the camps I would visit the the classes, and one kind of technique I had was I would go and I would speak to them in in Nepali, and in particular I'd speak to them in bad, broken Nepali, and hopefully I would I would make them laugh, and uh, and hopefully encourage them to to try out their English even though their English might not be perfect either. And the, the other reason... Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. The, the other reason I was, I was in Nepal, and perhaps the main reason I was there, was for my own formation. So, uh, I, I am still was then in formation, as they say, with the Jesuits. I was there as, as a regent. That was the, the term for that stage of formation. And so I was there you know, for myself, for my own personal growth and, and development. And I would say, you know, I, I did, was formed, did grow in, in many ways. Uh, one way was just you know, being exposed to a, a different culture that has a lot to offer, that has a lot that I could learn from. I think I, I grew in my capacity to, to uh, be a leader at times and, and work with a team and, and work with a partner. And uh, one thing I was kept in mind, Father Kolvenbach, who is the former general of the Jesuits, he wrote in a letter about Jesuits in this stage of formation, that they should grow in their ability to be self-giving. So that's something that I kept in mind and, and prayed about and, and tried to do. So I mentioned that I had a, a partner when I was working there, and uh, her name was Choki. And she, she's in one of the pictures, uh, when you get them passed around, there's a picture of a young Bhutanese woman with my parents. Um, you might recognize it. No, that's not it. <laughs> but good, good guess. And um, so, so we worked closely together. We worked together basically every day, Monday to Friday. Um, and she, she was a refugee herself. So she was from the camp, lived in one of the camps. But... Um, Okay, there's the picture. She she worked in one of the, or she she worked with Caritas. So so either I would meet her in the camp, or she would come to the office in the town, and meet me there, and we we work together pretty much every day, and we'd get on each other ner uh, each other's nerves sometimes, as will happen if you spend every day with somebody. And but I think generally we we work pretty well together, and I was I was quite dependent on her, especially at first, because of the the language barrier that I had going into the camps and you know she knew she knew the the language and the culture the situation in the camps so that there was a lot that she could help me with um, I certainly couldn't have done my job very well without her and I think it also said something to to the people that we were working with that um, you know that, that she and I were working together and were equals you know um, that the um, the refugee from the camp didn't have a lower status than I did, um, at least I hope not. And, um, and, and we became good friends, Choki and I, we're, we're still friends. She, she now lives in Dallas, Texas, with most of her family, so they've resettled there. Now, there's the, uh, the question, I, I guess, related to, uh, to the poor or, or being with the poor. Um, you know, I, I guess I, I asked myself at times when I was there, you know, in, in what way was I with the poor? And, and here in particular, I'm talking about the, the refugees in the camps who I think were, were poor in many ways. And what, one way to be, to be with the poor, or to be in sol solidarity, solidarity with the poor would be to live, live with the poor or live like the poor. And there were times when I was invited by, by someone in one of the refugee camps to stay with them, to stay the night in their camp. And I was actually not allowed to do that. But, um, but that was okay. Um, I, I, was, I was grateful for the, for the freedom that I did have. So like I, I was able to, to come and go from the camps as I pleased. On, on weekends, I could go on my own on, on my bicycle and uh, go into the camps and wander around and, and visit people. So I'm, I'm grateful that I was free to do that. Um, 
so, but yeah, I was not uh, actually living there with them. And as far as living like them, I'd say our, our community in the town where I lived, um, you know, perhaps we lived uh, fairly simply by North American standards, but fairly well compared to refugee camp standards. And I also realized that, you know, some of the, uh, the wealth we had, or at least the, the use of materials that we had, like, for example, using computers was, was very uh, important to our work. But I, I think I was with the poor in the, uh, in the sense of just kind of being with them, getting to know them, um, becoming friends with them. Like I mentioned, you know, I, I would go on weekends to the camps and just visit people. And in that way, I would, I would have a chance to, to see how people lived and to hear, hear the stories of their situation. So for example, one thing I saw when I was there, one time I, I walked into, it was a school day, and I walked into a school classroom. It was like a children's, children's classroom, and the, and the children were all on, on one, sitting on one side of the classroom. And the reason for that was there had been a storm the night before, and the, the rain had come through the walls, because it's bamboo walls. So the rain had come through one side and like soaked one side of the classroom, and they were all crammed onto the other side of the classroom. So that's the kind of thing that they lived with. Another thing, a, a story I heard, there was a, a young man named uh, Navin, and he told me once that, uh, that what he would do in the evenings in his home in the camp is that he would stay up until about 8 o'clock in the evening. He would stay up studying, reading his book by, by lamplight, you know, like they had no electricity, and maybe it was dark around 6 o'clock, so he'd stay up for two hours reading by lamplight, and then at that point, you know, he was tired and his eyes were straining and he'd turn out the light and, and go to bed at 8 o'clock. I guess there's not much to do in the dark after that. So, so those were, you know, examples of things I saw and, and heard when I was there. And, and I was also able just to, to be, be with the people, like I said, to visit and to accept, accept their hospitality, you know, very welcoming, generous, uh, hospitable people who would, you know, be very much glad to, uh, to invite me into their home and offer me some tea or whatever. There's one, one situation of an act of kindness, uh, generosity. Actually, this happened to me a couple of times where I was invited into someone's home and uh, it was a hot day, you know, which most days were there. And uh, someone would sit beside me and, and fan me with a hand fan. So, so that was something that maybe, maybe made me feel a little bit awkward, someone sitting beside me fanning me. But, uh, but I also I, I accepted the, uh, the act of kindness. And as far as the, the poor go, I think within the camps, there was also kind of the poorer or the, the poorest of the poor within the camps. Um, for example, the people who are not educated or uh, or people who are from a from a lower caste, and um, I guess one one barrier for me there was my uh, little uh, Nepali that I spoke. So I, I was I was unable to communicate in in much depth with uh, with these poor poor people who who were not able to speak English. For the most part, I was I was ignorant and kind of uh, happily ignorant of the of the caste system there. So I, you know, kind of didn't know who was from, from which group, and I was kind of okay with that, because I, I think that just kind of allowed me to, uh, to treat everybody equally. Um, there, there was one, one time I, I was in the camp, and a, a woman, one of the learners from the Spoken English Center, invited me to, to her home for lunch, and I, I accepted, and I went. And, and for some reason, I, I thought that I thought afterwards that maybe, um, maybe it was kind of surprising that she invited me, or maybe it was kind of bold of her to invite me. And I, I think the reason I thought that is that I, I found out later, you know, her, her family name is, is you know, from one of the, the lower castes or, or from, a, from one of the groups that's kind of outside the, uh, the caste system or the, or the structure or whatever. So these are, uh, I guess, 
ways in which I um, got to know the people, be with the people there. So to, to sum up my time in Nepal, um, I think one thing there, I, I made a contribution, thanks be to God, you know, doing my job as resource teacher. I was also formed and, and changed in many ways, for example, by receiving the, uh, the generosity, the, the welcome of the people there. And I, would, and I think it was important for me just to, to make friends with people. <laughs> And I'm reminded there of, of another Jesuit, an American Jesuit named uh, Cap Miller, Father Cap Miller, who's still in, the, in Nepal. And when he was asked what he does for the people there, what he does for the, the many people that he meets there in Nepal, his answer was, I become their friend. And I think if, there, if there's any way that I would say I was kind of uh, a missionary, it would just be in... In making friends with people, and I think if you're if you're friends with people, then then kind of it transcends some of the boundaries of, of who's who's giving to who or who's receiving from whom and, and that sort of things. As far as being a missionary, when I when I first got to Nepal, uh, the superior of the Jesuit community, who is also the the head of Caritas, he told me, and and another a woman, a religious sister who was new there. He told us that we're not there to evangelize. And uh, I think what he meant by that is that you know, we're here to, to do the education program and we're not there to uh, preach on, on street corners or to try to actively uh, gain converts or, or something like that. Um, having said that, you know, I, I was certainly open to talking about my faith, my religion, if, if people asked me about it. And, um, and I think you know there there are many ways to evangelize besides uh, preaching. You know, there's the the witness of our lives, or for me, there is this. Uh, I think the witness of just trying to be with the people and make friends with the people. Now the story doesn't end there because uh, the the Bhutanese Nepali people, many of them, are are now, as I mentioned, in the states or Canada. So. Since two, 2008, there's been a third country resettlement program going on, whereby refugees are, are being moved uh, to mostly to the States, also to Canada and a few other countries. And it's a, a fair number of people since 2008, over 80,000 people have left Nepal. And the reason for that basically is that um, the country of Bhutan has not agreed to, to accept them back into Bhutan. Um, so this is kind of an alternative solution of, of, uh, of, of what to do. Um, so, so through this process, man, many of the, the people that I knew there in Nepal, I've, I've also kept in touch with here. You know, they're living all over Canada and the States. And I've, I've managed to, to visit with them here and talk on the phone and whatever. And, and so also here in Canada, as newcomers to Canada, to see a bit of their situation and hear about the, the difficulties they have in, in a new country here. So difficulties, for example, about trying to find work or, uh, or families being separated. Um, yeah, sometimes, you know, with the resettlement that it, uh, it's hard to, to keep families moving together to, to one place. Um, or there's a challenge, for example, of trying to celebrate their, their Nepali festivals when when, when families are separated or, or when maybe you're working or going to school and you, uh, you don't have a holiday, you have to work or go to school when, when your country's you know, national or, or religious holiday is going on. And Quebec poses a, a particular challenge for, for these Bhutanese people because of the, the language problem there. Um, so there's, there's quite a number of these Bhutanese refugees in Quebec. Quebec City is the, the city that has welcomed more than any other city in Canada. And so there the challenge is, of course, learning the French language, where in the camps, the, the camps run by, or the camp schools run by Caritas were English language schools. So a lot of the refugees, especially the, the younger ones, uh, spoke good English. And then 
it could be frustrating for them to, to move to Quebec and their, their friends or family members are in Ontario or some other place where they're adapting a lot easier because they already speak English and some are reluctant to, to try to, you know, kind of start from scratch and, and learn the French language. And for that reason, a number of them have left Quebec and have moved to, to Ontario and different countries. So that's certainly a challenge. Then, and of course, just the challenge of, of coming to a new place where, where everything's different, you know, to, to go from living in a, a bamboo hut with a mud floor to, to living in, in an apartment building in Canada, you know, it's a big change. I was in Quebec City, excuse me, I was in Quebec City, I think two summers ago, and uh, visited a, a woman named uh, Baggy Maya, and her, her photo is, is in that group of photos as well, um, which, uh, which you may see. And it, it's, it's a photo of, of a few of us sitting at a table and there's just kind of bare, bare walls, nothing on the wall, which is indicative of the fact that they just moved in like a week earlier, just arrived and hadn't, you know, still settling in. And Buggy Maya, I, I, knew, her, I knew her from the camp and um, she, was in, in, she was one of the learners in the Spoken English Center. And she told me how t tough it was to move. She said that when she moved to Canada that she cried a lot and that in her grief she said, that she forgot her English and her French. So, um, yeah, she was in English classes and she'd also done a few French classes there in the camp. And also when I was in her apartment, she was uh, trying to use a washing machine for the first time. And she's like maybe 60 years old. And there was a y young woman, another Bhutanese um, woman, who'd been there a bit longer, who knew this system and was kind of teaching her how to use the washing machine. I, I was kind of thinking, you know, if this is going to be confusing or traumatic for her, you know, maybe she doesn't need to learn the washing machine. Maybe she could wash clothes the way she's done it for the last 60 years. On the other hand, you know, maybe that'll be a nice break for her to uh, throw things in the machine. That's an aside. I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't say that. But, uh, <laughs> but that, that's just an example of, uh, you know, the kind of thing that's, that's new and different. And, and for me, also here in Canada, I've, I've had the opportunity, the blessing to, to be able to, to meet and to visit uh, some of these families. And one thing I've been able to do here in Canada that I couldn't do in Nepal, like I said, I, I, w I was not allowed to stay in the camps and stay in people's homes overnight. But here in Canada, I have been able to do that. So yes, they're, they're very welcoming people. So for me to, to, to visit them and, and go into their home and, and stay for a cup of tea or something, you know, that's a, that's a great, great honor for them. And they'll, they'll in, in, almost always in, invite me to, to stay and have food, have a meal. And if I agree to that, then that's, that's even a greater honor. And then they'll ask me if I'll stay with them overnight, if I'll stay the night with them. And then that's kind of like a, a thrill of a lifetime for them <laughs> if, I, if I'll stay with them overnight. Um, so yeah, that just kind of says uh, how you know hospitable they are, and um, this, you know it's certainly inspiring, inspiring for me, or something uh, that hopefully rubs off on me. And I was also reminded when I was in in Quebec about uh, the time in the camp when when I, when I had someone sitting beside me and fanning me. So so here in in Canada, you know we have we have we have electric fans now rather than the hand fans. But uh, one time I, I, was, I was in the family's home and the young man was preparing the room for me to, to stay the night there with them. And, and I, I just watched this, he was very kind of carefully placing a, a fan on a chair next to my bed and trying to put it at the perfect angle so that I, you know, I would be uh, comfortable with the fan on me at night. So, um, yeah, so, so there's, there's, uh, I guess, different ways as well to kind of be with the poor. I guess this was my experience of in Nepal and then with these same people who are now, I think, poor in some ways here in Canada as they try to adjust to a new culture. And I think there, you know, there are many forms of, of poverty. I, I think of the poor and marginalized 
as people here in Canada, like who could be refugees or could be the the elderly or handicapped people or uh, native people. You know, I think there's different kind of groups or or levels of poverty. You know, and people uh, people that we can try to uh, to be to be in contact with to to become friends with. Um, and I'd like to tell you about one one more of my heroes of the missionaries, another Canadian Jesuit who went to Nepal. His name is Father Bill Robbins, and he's been in, in Nepal for many years, and I got to know him when I was there. And, uh, yeah, good man. He, he invited me to, to go out hiking with him, and he's like in his late 60s, so he's, he's in good shape going hiking. He's, he's been writing in, in recent uh, months or the last couple of years for a little Jesuit magazine called The Canadian Messenger of the Sacred Heart, writing about his experience in Nepal and working with the poor and, and you know, talking about how he tries to um, bring Christ to the people there. One thing, one thing he wrote is that uh, he, sees, he sees himself and the, the people of Nepal as people journeying together, as, as all of them pilgrims together going towards heaven. And he talked about uh, trying to do what he learned from the, from the hospitality of the people and trying to welcome anyone who came to his door and welcome people with open arms. And I'd like to uh, just read a little quote from Father Bill. So this, this is uh, something written by Father Bill Robbins. He says, Jesus was in Nepal long before the first Christian missionaries arrived. We missionaries have come to meet Jesus here and to help Nepal's wonderfully open people to get to know him a little. Insofar as we show people how to live Jesus' law of love, we can make the resurrection a reality in their lives. So for, for Father Bill, he talked about a missionary as being someone who is a friend of God and who knew God's love and who shared that with others. So uh, that's all I have. Thank you for listening. <laughs>